Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show for July 24th, 2019. Big show today. Just a huge show. The biggest show you've ever seen. Not really. It's 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 kind of it's slowed down. We're in the summer doldrums, um, but we've got plenty of television to talk about on the PC Gamer Show. Uh, and with me to talk about television today is... My cats are making a ruckus up there. Uh, Jody McGregor, our weekend editor uh, da, uh, over in Australia, is joining us for the first time. First time on the show or the podcast? Yeah, the first game? time on the show. Welcome, Jody. Long time listener. Right on. Hi. We're happy to have you. And you're going to be talking to us about what exactly? Can you can you give us a little sneak preview? Uh, yeah, the uh, 2008 MMO Warhammer Online, which was killed off by EA in 2013, is back thanks to some fans in a private server, and I've been testing that out heck yeah that's i love these kind of stories especially uh it's it's interesting to see these stories cropping up now um there was one i think west put out or someone put out about the cities of hero city of heroes uh uh server as well so i'm glad these these communities can live on uh tim clark brand director pc gamer also here guess what he's going to talk about (laughs) can you guess james do we do we want to do we want to reveal or do we do we want to retain some of the audience? Oh, some some tension, some surprise. Uh, let's just say I'm gonna. S- one of the things he's gonna talk about starts with a D, and one of them starts with an H. Uh, so fill in the rest. Um, and they both have to do with the, uh, well, cards and uh, numbers. Could be, could be Dota too. Could be could Dota. Be, you know, I've got really into that since last time I was on. Yeah, you're a big Dota head now. That's how it goes. All right. Uh, and I'm going to be talking, well, we're all going to be talking about, uh, the Witcher, uh, Netflix TV series trailer, which, which landed last Friday during Comic-Con. Um, and as you can imagine, we're all pretty interested, uh, in what that looks like and how that's going to interpret the books, not the games. It's interpreting the books. Um, so yeah. Fascinating, fascinating times. I, I never thought there'd be a Witcher TV series. Having like when that game came out, the first game came out. Gosh, I forget when. And I saw it on like what G4 TV and like a cheat codes ep- a show. I was like, this looks like trash. This is gonna be another one of those forgettable <laughs> RPGs. And here we are, uh, move ahead ten years or so, and it's it's gonna be the next Game of Thrones potentially. It won't be. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, before we get into any of that stuff, let's 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 talk about our highlights of the week. And our highlights of the week are anything that happened in games, uh, anything we played, anything we read about, anything related to games that we think is interesting, worth sharing. Um, and why don't we start? With, why don't we start with Tim? Tim, anything interesting this last week, or are you just kind of coasting on the same old, same old? Uh, I'm definitely still playing the same games, but uh, so this week on Tuesday, so uh, last night, yeah. Uh, I did the raid for about the new the new raid in Destiny for about I don't know the thirtieth or fortieth time, and I finally oh got the uh, the exotic submachine gun called Taraba, which I think is an Australian word, right, Jody? It means really? Tasmanian. Taraba? Apparently, it means ta- it's, a, it's an old Aboriginal word for Tasmanian devil. I had to oh, Google it I last night. Yeah, very late. Um, the gun's not very good, but I was uh, very excited <laughs> to get it. <laughs> That's the okay. Every time this is this That's is Destiny in a nutshell is all these fascinating exotics come out and they require jumping through so many loot like hoops uh, or playing the raid a, a thousand times and most of the time excusing like a couple that define the meta at, you know at any given season they're trash. I, I, <laughs> trash is too strong. I, okay. I, I actually think uh, the last couple have been good. The last couple being like okay. Anarchy, a grenade launcher, which stuck electrified grenades that you could kind of then draw a pattern with, and um, that was that was has turned out to be pretty good. And then the one before that was this giant fusion rifle that sprayed a kind of gout of fire that would then explode. <clears throat> so they were both decent. And then, but this one is like yeah, a Tasmanian devil themed submachine gun, and it has a perk called Ravenous Beast where the okay. more you do damage with it and the more you receive damage, it kind of like charges up and then you can unleash the beast. Uh, you have to then hit, re- like hold the reload key, which I don't really like as a mechanic it feels clunky. Hmm. And then it kind of just turns into this like crazy bullet hose for like about seven seconds. But it, the, the thing that universally people don't like about it is that um, if you swap to like, either your primary or your power weapon it loses it loses all the charge you've built up which seems really um 
that feels no bueno basically especially when you've got like there's a mach- there's another submachine gun called recluse which you get from i don't know why they're all like animal themed um from the competitive uh pvp mode which is just like insanely good and turns mm-hmm. out it's actually just strictly better but no no one really wants to probably hear about this james however like um something people might be able to relate to is i was the last person on my raid team to get it and th- they were all getting like quietly more and more sick i think of running the raid only for me not to get the one thing <laughs> we were kind of there for so there was like a yeah. general sort of sense of relief that we could uh we could now move on to doing other stuff i guess and we were just um we were just writing about on the website uh the solstice of heroes event which All comes right. next week like super super grindy thing where you um get this really glitzy armor that can be upgraded and upgraded till you get kind of a glowing version um it's a long old slog to get it and they've they've done interestingly something which they didn't do last year um which is they're going to make this armor the first that will become compatible with the new armor system that's dropping in um, uh, september okay which is going to have like a bunch more you, you're going to be able to basically put more mods onto the armor it's going to have more stats they're going to bring back strength intellect and discipline as three stats that determine cooldown so um they're trying to like lean into the rpg side that's something we've written about on the site um and I think a lot of people were worried that they were going to kind of bust their asses for like, you know, a matter of a couple of weeks only for this stuff to be then immediately, um, immediately kind of obsolete. Which I'm sure Jody mm-hmm. would just tell you is, is the way of MMOs and tough shit suckers. But uh, <laughs> it seems to have been met with some relief. So yeah, I'll be doing that like the junkie scum I am next week. I got a quick question for you. Uh, we won't turn this into the Destiny 2 hour, I promise, listeners. But do you think by kind of... I don't know how much we know about how they're opening up the mod system and and mm. the RPG ness of the game, but do you think that can alleviate some of the problems with these kind of, as I as I call them, trash exotics? It can open up builds that better utilize them or make trash guns. Uh, Maybe yeah. I, I mean I think I think like a good armor build probably isn't going to make a bad gun good, but I think okay. like for people willing to like. I think even like right now there is the potential to make some pretty cool builds. Like I've, I've made kind of a, <clears throat> there's a kind of build doing the round using, do you, do you actually want to know this? <laughs> sure. Hit us. There's like a, there's like a shotgun that you can use where if you land all the pellets of the shot, then your next punch does a lot of damage. And there's like an exotic piece of armor that if you land a punch, your next punch does a lot of damage. You can kind of chain those together. So then you stack a bunch of mods in that are kind of based on having your melee charge right, and, right. and stuff. So there's stuff like that you can do, but I, I, it, none of us would pretend that this is kind of like the level of depth you can get into is, you know, a Diablo yeah. or uh, any one of a number of kind of MMOs. But I, I think it's, in, I think it's going to be a really interesting thing to see how it plays out because by doing that, you are kind of doubling down on your core users and, and, mm. and accepting you're going to kind of burn off, the more casual player who the the thing that kind of is striking to me is if i inspect people in the tower which is the social area it breaks my heart because generally i'll see them now using all sorts of mismatched garbage perks like kind of shotgun reloader but they don't have a shotgun equipped uh-huh. and for me as someone who kind of wrestles with inventory ocd like that like blows my mind like if if i have a single perk not synergizing I almost feel like I have to tear the build off, <laughs> rip the armor off, off me. Um, yeah. So I wonder how uh, people, it's one of those things where people say they want this depth, but I wonder, do they really want this depth? I, I think for the for, for, for the guys I play with and girls, like, yes. Um, but it's going to be an interesting ride for that game. But the, the game's in a good spot at the moment, I would say. Cool, cool. It should be a... a I just checked, uh, Sorry, go Taroba ahead. is not a craft beer, by the way. Oh, disappointing. <laughs> it's a real missed opportunity. Yeah, so... what, 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 um... What caught me out on that quiz, the one Jody's referring to, is we ran on the site a while ago. Is it a craft beer or an exotic piece of gear? So and the, the thing that was tricky was a lot of them were both. Like, mm-hmm. there's a weapon called Telesto, which I was like, oh, well, it's just a gun, obviously. But it turns out there's a beer called Telesto as well. No Some idea what. Really specific stuff. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's wild. But again, <clears throat> there's so much damn craft beer in the world now. Like, you, know, you could, like, pick, point at a word in the dictionary and it's a craft beer. Um, but cool. Destiny 2 is still trucking along. Seems like it's going to be, at least for the hardcore players, it's like a, it's, it's a nice smooth road until Shadowkeep. Um, yeah, the biggest, the, biggest, uh, the biggest kind of bump Shadowkeep's going to face is the fact that Borderlands is out oh, the week yeah. before or the week after, I forget. Oof. And like they are obviously two, go- two games gunning for very much the same audience. That's going to hurt. Uh, all right. 
my attention yeah. and time wise. Okay, cool. Uh, Jody, we'll save your highlight for last since it transitions into our first topic. Uh, but for me, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, because I, I have not been doing much, uh, video game stuff in my personal time. Well, a lot of it, but the variety of it is, is the problem. I've been playing Final Fantasy 14 pretty much nonstop for the last two weeks. I think I have 70 hours clocked in two weeks and I don't know why I'm still doing this. It's not, it's it, the, a realm reborn stuff up until up through the patch content. I'm still on that stuff. And that's the stuff everyone says is a slog and is pretty boring. And there are highlights in there. It's fascinating to me yeah. because final fantasy 14 is barely an MMO. It's really like an MMO masquerading as this single player, uh, not even an RPG last week. I called it like a visual novel because the combat is so passive for most of that early, early game stuff. Um, and you're just moving between quest markers to watch uh, fantasy stuff happen at you with that, with little say, no say in in how it how it uh, proceeds. So the role playing element is kind of like left to the imagination. Um, uh, but I'm still on it, and I'm still into it because it's the summer. What, what made you want to jump in suddenly, James? I you that, know that game's been around for a long time. Why did you suddenly decide now is the right time for this to be spending? your evenings on hearing everything about Shadowbringers, like it, i did a bit of research and talked to steven a bit more on the show about it and it it really piqued my interest um primarily because it, folks were saying the storytelling was the thing and the storytelling was uh uh the best in the whole fi in the final fantasy series overall and uh i also went back and uh watched those no clip documentaries that kind of tell the story of how this game came out and was basically dog shit and then remade in the over the course of three years. And that was like fascinating from a, I don't know, from a journalist perspective, I guess a professional perspective, because I really wanted to see like how, hear that story and see what they were capable of making in that time and sort of live that history in a uh, that six year track from A Realm Reborn to, uh, uh, Shadowbringers, um, in in my own way, to be a part of that sort of uh, zeitgeisty stuff when it happens when a new expansion comes out every two years, and I'm paying the fucking price because so much of it is so boring and poorly designed in this early, like in this. But it is setting up. It is a very like sophisticated story. It, uh, there's a lot of socio political. Uh, conflict and some really smart stuff that d deals with colonialism and imperialism and it's and and capitalism it's final fantasy uh for meanwhile you're just trying to power level brutally through it as quickly <laughs> as you can the thing is like it, uh i'm at a like you can follow most of the main quests and never hit uh, uh a point where you need to power level uh there's maybe one or two points in that that first uh campaign where i had to fucking like go off and do dungeons and i was like wow i hate mmos why am i doing this and then you get back on the story and you're like okay this is great um so yeah it's it's uh it's just a nice passive summer game but also just fascinated with the history of it and want to sort of i don't want steven to be the only guy who gets to be part of the cool club uh you know every time an expansion comes out maybe he's just lying to us and he doesn't play these and he just writes a review and because no one else plays them and uh, uh i want to be able to basically be a steven messner cop and uh there's there's a thing happening in a that's it's not really a thing happening but there's a, a thing in destiny 2 at the moment where there's a resource called barian bows which are like these kind of like purple yeah, yeah, yeah. purple like plants from the dreaming city zone mm -hmm. yeah. and they have no real use in the game so they've become like a joke so everyone's like been stacking <laughs> them in the thousands i've probably got like about good god eight, eight or nine thousand uh, and one of the community managers put out an offer because people have been begging to have this resource be able to be turned in for anything else and uh, one of the community managers said that they would offer like a free copy of the new expansion for the first player to get like a hundred thousand of these mats in their inventory Ooh. and there's like two streamers like now racing to do it and i think <laughs> one's up to like one's up to like 30k but they're just oh running God. the same like lost sector which are these very small dungeons that take a couple of minutes to do just over and over again just for the kind of ep points it is funny but at the same time also makes you want to be sick at the thought of it. <laughs> I, I admire it from in, in a detached uh, detached way but i also get it some i don't know like there's something about these really rote tasks and games that are are just it, for a certain headspace for me are so satisfying it just feels like i'm doing 
did I, did I tell you I've been AFK farming like a madman as I, well? I was gonna I was gonna bring that up. Like, there's an exploit <laughs> yeah. currently in Destiny Two where you can. You don't I don't know if it's actually game. technically an exploit because okay. I mean it is, isn't it? It's definitely against. <laughs> the service. So the the beauty of this one is that um, for for the new. Uh, to get one of the other new guns, it's so actually a gun they brought back from the first game called Bad Juju, which is this cool uh, gun with kind of a skull jammed on the front of it, which generates uh, energy for your ult the more you use it. Um, but you had to like hand over like an enormous amount of resources, especially if you did it early to the kind of the, the magical statue. Um, and people didn't really want to do that, or or at least they got kind of cleaned out of their all their mats. So they needed to like build the stock back up. Mm-hmm. And someone worked out that you could queue into this old activity that people don't really do very much anymore, and like gimp your power level so low that you could never complete the activity. So that way, the game matches you with other people who are doing the same bullshit. So all of you fail the activity within like uh, a minute, basically, mm-hmm. and because it because the failure is so fast, the game never kicks you for AFKing. It just queues up mm. another instance straight away. <laughs> so, so me and a bunch of people, and this is all over the internet, so I'm not, it's not some great revelation, uh, are putting on like our crappiest gear from the collections, queuing this thing, switching our monitors off, and just letting it run overnight. And Austin, who works for Games Radar, he and I like sit there happily looking at our third party like uh, inventory management thing, watching the resource tick up in the background. <laughs> it's really slow. Like you get You're two like checking stocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, you kind of turned... <laughs> you've turned it into a clicker game you've made destiny yeah. 2 into an idle game i mean you're not even clicking you just i'm literally <laughs> running in my apartment like back home the only thing i'm worried about is electricity and burning the place down while my dog's in it which would be bad <laughs> um, they don't Bungie have got a pretty um loose response to those kind of things so long as you're not harming other players like they have mm-hmm. they have been like banning people in waves who've been doing afking in any modes where people are trying to play it properly yeah that said if you're listening to this bungee, that was all satire and I'm not actually doing it. <laughs> He's protected. He's protected. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Destiny 2. I'll stop talking about it now. No, it's, what, last anecdote. I, I, it's, it's a fascinating thing to follow. More than I like playing it these days, I just like following the story of this strange series. Uh, yeah, that, that that's my highlight. Let, let, let's, let's hear what Jody's uh, been up to and, and, and following. Uh, so my highlight of the week is uh, a news one that the Warhammer 40,000 book series Eisenhorn is being turned into a TV show, which is good news because like there was a straight to DVD CG Warhammer 40,000 movie and it sucked. It was so I, bad. I went to the cinema but... to see that, Jody. I saw it in oh, a cinema. Oh my oh God. Man. I was oh invited man. by the PR back when I lived in England. And I went with a bunch of Warhammer fans from PC Gamer and elsewhere at Future. And I don't know, we came out like we'd witnessed a murder of a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Tragic. But what might make this TV show better is, for starters, that it's not about the Space Marines, who, hmm. like, they're cool looking, but they don't have a huge amount of personality. And it's hard to base, you know, hours of entertainment around watching them be gruff. Uh, so this is about a guy named Eisenhorn, who's an inquisitor, which is like, he's basically a detective in the books. It's all first person. And he narrates like he's a Raymond Chandler, badass going around, uh, solving crimes and hunting heretics. And I think like a detective show is a much better format for like, you know, a a weekly show set in this weird, extravagant sci-fi universe, because it means you don't have to actually explain what the main character is up to. You can have all of the crazy setting stuff going on in the background and just have it be, basically a cop show in the foreground it's rad so um yeah i've read the books and they are good they're not like you know masterpieces the third (laughs) one kind of sucks but they're fine and i could see them being adapted into a good show like they have a format and a formula that you could work with right on and and see i was i was super excited as soon as i read this as well and i was like fucking typing in caps in the slack going tell tom senior to get out of bed it's happening Tom, <laughs> tom's also a warhammer fan and then like i don't know if it was wes or whoever was trying to drag me down going oh jody says eisenhorn's trash you're not going to enjoy it but, you know the but video game to... eisenhorn was trash. oh there you go there that's what i was saying like he's been adapted into a bad video game but it could make a good tv show it'd be like a redemption so Just cast mark strong and you're up. Yeah, I, so I follow a bunch of like miniature painting accounts on instagram now that's one of my main uh instagram uh, like bits of the Venn diagram along with 
kind of cute dogs and <laughs> Arsenal Football Club and girls with tattoos, like Warhammer <laughs> painting is a big thing. And uh, a lot of those guys were saying Mark Strong is like has to be cast. Is, is, does he feel like a natural fit for you? Well, yeah, he voiced that character in the right. video game, and it mm. feels he deserves another chance. He also voiced the main character in uh, the THQ Space Marine game, which was really good. Like, yeah, that's a that solid, a good like, 7 out of 10 action game that rules when you want a 7 out of 10 action game. That, that game so, was made, one of the lead guys on that was uh, Ralph uh, Van Lirop, who's now making The Long Dark. He was up at, um, mm. was it Relic? I think Relic made it. Yes. Nice guy. Yeah. So, and, and yeah. Th this show is, uh, I'm not looking at the article right now, it should be, but it's at least the showrunner, some people who were involved with the, the Man in the High Castle, Amazon's The Man in the High yeah. Castle, is that right? Yeah, the showrunner is uh, Frank Spotnitz, who gotcha. was the showrunner, I think, for the first season of The Man in the High Castle, maybe the second. Uh, and I know him before that, he was on The X-Files, well, before oh. that, like 20 years ago. Ooh. So he was a writer and producer on The X-Files for years. Right on. It seems like a good fit. I guess, like, in I think Evan was the one who brought this up. He's Evan is particularly worried about the CGI budget uh, and uh, and the amount of CGI you would need to do this universe justice. <laughs> um, seems like uh, a lot, a lot. Do you do you think this setting in particular can get away like with a, like with a television show budget, a meager television show budget, and depict the world in an interesting way, or? Yeah, maybe it's, picture. I got my fingers crossed. Mm. The thing about, like, as I was saying, it being, you could turn it into a cop show is that that means the main characters don't have to be mm -hmm. eight foot tall, superhumans in power armor and <laughs> aliens. You can have the main characters be the base level humans of the setting who are relatively down to earth and ordinary. And you can have all of the crazy stuff in the background, but that would mean at least you don't have to have a bunch of CG aliens on the screen all the time. Do you, do you think the dream is that we end up with something kind of of the quality of like I guess the Expanse show, which which feels like achievable, where it's like you say mostly humanoid characters, maybe it's set on yeah. like a hive world or something, and you just kind of aliens or something exotic that happen every now and then, and because the problem is always like as someone who's read I think like you have a bunch of like the Horus Heresy books, they're very much like big sweeping scope and huge battles and you just go like if it had the budget of a film i'd be skeptical of it even being able to pull those off so like much less a tv show like i know people people definitely joked about the expanse and it kind of looking like the ships were a bit kind of cardboard early on but at least it was you know felt like a relatively good hard sci-fi if that's what you'd call the expanse show yeah, I guess I guess that's it. I, I've been burned so many times, Jody. Is what I'm trying to say, like by by yeah. all kinds of Warhammer tie-ins, especially 40k. Just numb to it now. Yeah, yeah, uh, but no, I I think it could work. Like you're saying, like Warhammer 40,000 is so over the top. That's what it's all about. Everything is huge. There are too many people. Everything is really ornate and gothic and filigreed. But if you see that weird world through the eyes of like a detective and his sidekicks just trying to make the world a better place on a handful of weird planets, I think you could maybe do it justice. What what you want is like the creepiness, the fanaticism, the sense that life is incredibly cheap, the sense that the Imperium yeah. itself is basically kind of this rotten structure, kind of nonetheless but probably still the lesser of the other evils that it could be, but still like, you know, led by a, a man God who's being fed thousands of sacrifices every day. You, you have to get all that stuff, that tone right, which I think is quite hard. Um, but if they can, it'll probably be a cult hit. I just, I just, I don't want to be hurt again. <laughs> yeah. Not to, not to spoil the books too much. One last thing I'll say though, is that Eisenhorn is a character who his arc is him sort of realizing that the Imperium he works within is corrupt and awful and bureaucratic and a fascist state and that maybe he's not actually upholding the law of a place that's so great uh, and he sort of has to go a bit renegade which is much better than a show that could be enjoyed by a bunch of gross dudes which is the problem with warhammer 40,000 and its fans <laughs> yep uh, i've met plenty um but i mean that I, i'm i'm fascinated now this is the kind of thing that might get me into this series um it's also fascinating because the story of of, of sort of being nested and coming to realize uh the bureaucracy and uh fascism driving 
uh, driving these settings is is totally happening in Final Fantasy XIV too, and that seems to be a a trend in storytelling lately, uh, unsurprisingly. But uh, cool. James, did I ever tell you I got headbutted at a Warhammer event, like in real life? <laughs> what? No joke. No joke. It like, was at Games wait, Day. Uh, wait. Okay. Yeah, just tell us what. It was like a rules dispute that ended in actual violence. Yeah, he sort of said, like, I'm going to come around the table and stick one on you. And he did. I, I called his bluff and he did. He was Good much God. bigger than me. Yeah. Wow. I, I ended up getting given, because uh, the, the event was in, like, it would have been Birmingham, I think, the NEC. Like, it yeah. was a uh, games day. I was competing with my Wood Elf army. Um, I mean, that's most of the story. I got driven back to London on the coach, and the guy who ran the shop in London, a guy called Ed Spatigue, yeah. gave me like a free copy of. Do you remember that kind of Warhammer like city building game, Jody? It was like a, it was like a board game with kind of. It never really took off. Was it called Empires mm. or something? It wasn't very good. Oh, Mighty but, Empires. Yeah, I think so. He gave me a copy yeah. of that as like basically hush money, so I wouldn't tell my <laughs> mum and dad. But How I old did were tell you? My, I mean, I was probably like. I was at secondary school, so I was probably like 12, 13, maybe older, oh, maybe 14. Beautiful. That's prime Warhammer range. But I, I had like a bit, I had like a welt on my forehead where I'd been given the nut. So uh put me off a little bit. That Warhammer yeah. crowd, damn. Uh, yeah, tough crowd. Let's keep, let's keep, uh, let's keep the Warhammer train going and uh, move on to Jody's topic today uh, about the resurgence or the second life of a much beloved uh, Warhammer MMO. Tell us the story, Jody. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning was Mythic's MMO that ran from 2008 to 2013 uh, before sadly being killed off. And over the last few years, a group of fans have been bringing it back. There's a community project called Return of Reckoning, which is just one private server where you can log on today, you can download everything, and you can start playing again which is great because this was like a really beloved MMO, maybe not on the same level as City of Heroes. It doesn't have thousands Mm -hmm. of people playing it. The population is more like the hundreds and most of them are in Europe. So not my time zone, but what they love about it is, is a few things, but mostly the PVP was really good and something that no other MMO has really done as well since. Because this was Mythic uh, coming off the back of Dark Age of Camelot, which had this great like realm versus realm PvP combat where you would, you would have huge armies of players like fighting on battlefields. And so they figured, well, you know, it's got the word war in the title, let's do that, but even bigger for Warhammer Online. So the PvP is really the main attraction for this community, and it's why they've all come back and why hundreds of them are logged on and just constantly at war. Right on. So do, do you know, like, uh, who kind of got this going or like how this this sprouted sprouted up? Yeah, I've, I've spoken to a couple of the people involved and uh, they wanted to be anonymous for obvious reasons. But sure. basically during the final days of Warhammer Online, a bunch of the players started collecting the packet data that was being sent like between them and the server so that they could back it up in the future. And an emulation project on GitHub called... Uh, war emu started up after that and there were like a couple of false starts because a lot of work needed to be done with the packet data that they they had to turn it into the actual game again and get Mm -hmm. a server actually working and they are still working on it like it's in alpha so expect bugs if you go and check this out (laughs) but there are now 22 of them in five different teams all working on this thing, and they have what? got it working. Like, you can play any of the characters, the six factions, each with four classes. The combat works. You can level up. Uh, they haven't added, like, the area that was added in the expansion, but uh, apart from that, almost all of the content's actually there in the game. And they're, they're patching it. So they're, they're not just recreating what it was like mm. when it died. They're building on that. So they're actually putting in balance patches because it's a PvP game primarily. Ah. It needs to be balanced. So it needs frequent patching. So that's also a focus of theirs, which has been controversial with the community because, of (laughs) course, it has. Oh, yeah. You got to expect that. You know, uh, any change to any uh, meta is going to make people mad and make people happy. But Mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious, like, do you know if – is this like – 
has the developer come out, the original developer come out, or any of, I don't know if they're still together or not, but, uh, and said anything, or is this like legally questionable, uh, especially once more people become aware of it? I, I'm just, I'm curious if you know anything about what it takes to keep this going, uh, besides, uh, however many, all those people in, in separate teams, uh, maintaining the live services. Well, the developers haven't said anything and neither have Games Workshop, but gotcha. the thing is it's not competing mm -hmm. with any of the many actual Warhammer games that exist. All of the other Warhammer games are either like single player or maybe like sort of small scale multiplayer or there's just, there's no other MMO right. set in this universe. So it's not actually competing with any of the other games. And that is why, you know, they have their fingers crossed they're not going to get a dmca and so far they haven't like they've been working on this for a long time gotcha. and building up this community and so far so good it's fast Jody, if you if you could put any developer to work on the warhammer forty thousand universe game of your choice which developer would it be and what would the genre be um see like a year ago, you asked me, I would have said Bioware, a single player RPG, just give me 40k <laughs> Mass Effect. But yeah, yeah now I have maybe changed my mind about that. Yeah. My, my answer was always that I would want Respawn to do like a, just a fairly, not basic, but kind of like tr trad shooter. Um, mm -hmm. Given that I think their they're kind of sci fi gun stuff is so good and they kind of get that kind of kinetic vibe really well but now they're doing star wars that's kind of not i mean it was never going to happen anyway but it's even less likely to happen yeah maybe obsidian uh but sorry go for it jody i was just going to say the thing about warhammer online that makes its pvp special is uh what they call open realm versus realm combat so this isn't like if you've done pvp in other mmos you might be used to it being like instanced or on a separate server but in this game there's an area of every single map that's uh they call them lakes because that's the shape they are mm. uh there, some of them might be forests or beaches or anything but just on that there's a roughly oval shape on the map that overlaps with one of the other factions maps and if you cross the boundary you go through like a war camp there's barriers there's artillery and then on the other side of that line you're just at war so you can cross at any time from the PVE area, even right from level one, just over into another area where you'll be leveled up to match like the the basics of that tier. And then you just immediately get, you start getting killed by the other players. <laughs> it's great. That, that's and fascinating. And to stop people from abusing that by going back to the early tiers when they're higher level, if you return to one and you're above the point where like it'll level match you it'll bump you up to level 11 or whatever if you're too low and if you're too high it'll say leave or you'll be transformed into a chicken and that's what happens <laughs> that's you so... just run around as a stupid little chicken until somebody ganks you i was gonna say like i'm just trying to imagine this so was it commonplace to just see at any given time like four or five chickens just running around this this beautiful ornate uh vast field <laughs> uh you would occasionally see people like do it as a challenge run kind of right. thing where they'd get together and all go in as chickens and try to get a kill as a chicken because you can do like one point of damage by just pecking at someone <laughs> and if you knock the great. last point of damage off someone then you can get a kill as a chicken but no that's most it. of the time uh people actually took it really seriously like yeah. it had a, a tactical depth though hmm classes all had interesting things they could do there was a uh, collision detection was turned on in those lakes so as a oh. tank you could just physically block other players hmm. so as well as having like guard abilities that would protect you know you could soak some damage from the caster near you or whatever but you could also just literally stand in front of them and they would have to push past you to get at like the ranged characters behind you uh, they even made healers interesting you had to cast attacking spells as a healer to power up your heal spells so you're sort of alternating between healing and attacking to be most effective mm. so you weren't just the guy standing there going heal 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 you actually got to blow things up as well some push pull there that's that's mm. fascinating you don't really see mmos or at least the, the popular mmos experimenting much in the pvp arena like that i'm kind of wondering like why do you think I don't know why. Why didn't this catch on or, or uh, get more people interested who were 
into MMOs? Well, it did at first. Okay. Uh, they had like a peak of 800,000 players at one point that sold over a million copies. But three months later, uh, oh, which was the big World of Warcraft expansion that came out in November of 2008? Was it Wrath of the Lich King? That sounds about right. Yeah. Basically what happened was that a lot of Warhammer Online's audience was jaded World of Warcraft mm -hmm. players who were sick of the fact that it hadn't updated for a while. And then it updated, and they <laughs> left in droves. And its player numbers dropped from that 800,000 peak down to about 300,000 mm -hmm. over the course of the next few months. And because it was so focused on PvP, and even in the PvE stuff, uh, there were these things called public quests, like what Guild Wars 2 has now, where if you're in the right area and someone is doing a quest, you just get a little pop-up in the corner of your screen that says, do this now, and you can join in and start playing alongside them and you immediately get grouped together and you get to share the rewards and you do some neat quest as a group. Right. But if there aren't enough other players around for that to work, for you to finish that, and if there aren't enough players around for the PvP to be balanced and feel fair, then it kind of sucks. Kind of just the bottom falls so, out. Mm. Yeah. Once you lose that mass of players, they did all of these things to try to make it work. They lowered yeah. the requirements for those public quests. They reduced the number of servers. They smushed them together so that uh, at the start, you'd start in uh, one of like six different faction zones, depending which faction you were playing. And then they forced you to start in like the Empire and Chaos starting zones just to get the players who remained all playing together. But it sort of it dragged its life out for a few more years, but it was definitely limping along. Ah, uh, bummer. It's it's fascinating now because, well, in chat, first Turdog says Cataclysm was two thousand eight in November, so maybe that's the expansion we're talking about. But um, it's fascinating now because I, I think WoW is sort of in this lull, and and a lot of folks consider the latest expansion and the ensuing patches to be an absolute low point for the series, and maybe it's just like because people are interested in, in, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's compelled people to look elsewhere at other MMOs. Like Final Fantasy XIV is having this moment right now. You're seeing these old community servers crop up like this and uh, uh, the City of Heroes. And I, I wonder if, if WoW is just finally sort of going to peter out. I don't know how they can reinvent that game without just making the PvP something else or making the questing something else or, or gutting so many systems to uh, uh, reinvent it. And, and so now we're seeing folks look to like Final Fantasy 14 for the PVE is, is extremely robust. And I don't know, I wonder if Warhammer uh, Age of Reckoning or something like it is, is, uh, is about ready to experience another moment, especially with, due to your uh, incoming story. Um, for the PvP aspect, because I think that is something in MMOs that has been lacking for a while. Um, and uh, so now's a good time, maybe a good time to check it out. Uh, uh, so you do have a story coming out, like going into depth on, on this topic. Yeah, Wes is editing it right now. So uh, I spent the last few weeks catching up uh, on where it's at, because I, I tried it out a, a couple of years ago when it first started, and it was not super playable. But mm -hmm. where it is now, it's still in alpha. There are still you're going to encounter bugs. Some of the quests won't work, but you can actually play it and have a good time. So yeah, I've got a feature going up soon. Right on. Uh, and and I'm I'm guessing that'll have links to everything you need to download it or check it out yourself. Um, or at yeah. Least point you to the community. Right yeah. Uh, one of the players I spoke to actually is a guy named Zarbix who does mm -hmm. these great YouTube tutorials that can help you figure out like not only how to download and get this thing working, but also how to start playing and what to do. So if you just look up Zarbix on YouTube or Twitch, you'll find him. Hell yeah. I'm looking forward to that story. Uh, especially, I don't know, MMOs have got my eye uh, recently and, and the history of them. So I think it's time. It's time. Mm -hmm. It's time. Warhammer online and this resurgence is called, uh, shoot, not Age of Reckoning. Return of Reckoning. Return of Reckoning. So cool. Thanks, Jody. Um, fascinating stuff. Uh, I wonder what the next one will be if the next MMO. <laughs> James, James, I don't think you've got the patience to be a true MMO guy. I, I know I don't. Like uh, ne next time I'm back on the show, you'll have dumped Final Fantasy. <laughs> like uh... I don't know, man. Like they're telling me. Here's the thing about Final Fantasy, 14. Sorry to uh, talk about it again, but it 
most of the time it articulates just just like a single player game like i don't have to talk to anybody i never have to grind for anything i just like do stuff and then anime s stuff happens like i'm at a i reckon point... you do have to grind for stuff you just haven't got to the true grind yet uh well there... there's not been an mmo made where you didn't have to grind. as as steven describes it it's most of that stuff you don't have to bother with if you just want to play through the story and like dress up you can and that's cool uh but if you do want to grind for like some end game gear do the harder raid harder versions of the raids for sure uh yeah I, I don't think i'll ever do that i don't think i'll ever do that it's not it's kind of like not you my can't, thing you can't trust steven's word that's not like asking i know fucking <laughs> this cigarette company where the smoking's cool steven's not grinding is 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 grinding he's just so he's so uh brainwashed by mmos over the years that just don't that doesn't know when he's not having fun um it's a sickness it's a sickness anyway uh Let's move on to our next topic, and what do I have here? Oh, yeah, The Witcher. You guys ever heard of this? this, this no, tell us about it, James. The Witcher. Is it popular? Uh, yeah. what so is it? The Witcher? It's the guy who's Superman. You know Superman? Is it about witches? Uh, uh, sort of. There's witches in there. You're like a mute. It's like it's basically like uh, X-Men, but you have a sword? No. Okay. Uh, we good. all know what The Witcher is. Uh, it's one of our most, I think... Uh, generally i don't want to speak for all of pc gamer but it's one of our favorite series as as a, a collective human under humans under a publication overall Wait, is, is the top 100 the new top 100 out now i don't i don't think it's online no. yet uh it's it's not out yet okay yeah so okay. no spoilers i think the magazine is at the printers okay. okay it's happening soon it's happening soon but where does the witcher land i wonder hmm hmm it's going to be an interesting, interesting top 100. Uh, for sure, we move stuff around. With with Sam with Sam out now, it's, uh, Witcher's going to be, off. who knows what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, uh, we finally got, we've known that Netflix uh, bought a, a series um, for The Witcher, uh, gosh, like last year, maybe two years ago. And we finally got to see the first teaser trailer. It's coming out in sorry my phone heard me and and <laughs> is it is it going to tell us it, it 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 was like do you want to know what the witcher is and it pulled up the wiki for the witcher <laughs> i know what the witcher is Siri. um yeah it's supposed to come out this fall there's no hard date uh for the series but uh it's it's interesting gerald is uh henry cavill 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 i don't know how you say his last name cavill uh, a very handsome, strong man uh, who I, I don't, I don't know. First of all, okay, let, we'll play the trailer in a bit, but uh, this has been like the biggest point of contention for most people is we saw that first image of him, like that test image where he's wearing the wig. And I think everyone was like, what the fuck is going on? But now that we've seen it in action, we've seen him move around and talk and speak uh, as, uh, as Geralt. What's, what's your take on, on, on uh, Henry as as our favorite Witcher, he's so buff. He's I was so not buff. expecting him to be just so big. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I had low expectations because, like you said, that picture of him in the wig—it was not a great picture. I think in motion it looks better. Mm -hmm. Like he looks fine as Geralt in that trailer, which is the more, more stubbly. The more part. stubbly has, the better it is. He needs. Yeah, they need sure. to rough him up as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It's Jody's right. I mean, he looks swole as as fuck, yeah. and I think that's because just like every Hollywood leading man is now, they all go on these insane personal trainer, intense gym regimens before they do anything. So I think that's just like the generic default setting. I, I, in some ways, I'd have loved to have seen like them find an unknown who could have just made the role their own because Cavill brings with him the baggage of Superman to a degree, and it's. I don't know. He's he wasn't like a, ever an actor who I thought, wow, this guy's amazing. Like I can't wait to see what he does next. He's mm -hmm. just kind of this human mannequin who looks quite, I guess, superhero-y. Um, but I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. I I felt like intensely nervous watching it, like <laughs> just because I think like I, I, I'm I'm trying to think like is there a version of that show that could be made which would make people happy? And it's very hard for me to kind of like no. envisage a world in which that's the case. One of the things I think that stands in its favor is that kind of going back to what we were saying about the Eisenhorn show, like they don't have to do great big pitch battles, although there is kind of a bit of a pitch battle in, in the trailer because 
your experience of Geralt through the games, although like, this is, as I understand it, more based on the books, is is him kind of fighting relatively smaller numbers of things, some of which are big monsters, which it strikes me like FX and TV can probably just about manage. Mm. Whereas it would be with the big kind of sweeping Games of Thronesy things where it would likely completely fall apart. So, so I think with any luck, they'll be wise and stick to the political intrigue with some big monsters. And uh, on that basis, I think it can be okay. I mean, we're all going to watch it, right? But basically what's oh, going to yeah. happen is everyone's going to watch about it and everyone's going to fuck prepare yourself for witcher twitter on oh god the, day the that takes comes out. the takes maybe, gonna be maybe just meet the witcher now yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be rough yeah i don't know like uh for me he's fine as girl we'll see like I, I i think what we're missing is this trailer is definitely it's definitely positioned to capture the attention of anyone who liked game of thrones i i definitely feel like it's all right, Netflix is coming out. It's got this epic score. You don't see any of the the lightness or the humor we we associate with the Witcher universe in this trailer at all. It's very much just action, dark scenes, drama, intrigue, some some light occulty magic, which I love the series for. It's it's take on magic, um, violence, and is it going to be sexy? Guns. There's like a kind of there's kind of like a nice wide shotty bit where there's some people banging in the back. Oh, definitely. Like if if you read the books, uh, they especially the the sorcerers and sorceresses like are horny all the time. They're just like a very <laughs> horny kind of group of people. Um, and we we've been told the uh, the showrunner has said this is going to be an adult show, and so you can okay. expect plenty of that. I just I wonder like I hope they. I mean that's a whole other thing. Is like we can't help but compare this to game of thrones and game of thrones used sex in a very traditionally hbo way to me just like mm. we got boobs we got people having sex because this world is crazy and in the witcher it's much more in like it makes more sense uh, when you learn more about this the sorcerers and sorceresses and like sort of just the reason they are so free and open is because they've lived for so fucking long many of them have uh they've they 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 touch this the magic which is like basically controlled chaos and uh they're horny because they're just open like friendly advanced progressive people in that way um and in many ways they are they are not uh maybe politically and bureaucratically um but it makes more sense and i, I hope like the show could be very smart in that way uh the, the fiction it's based on is is very uh clever i think um with how sure. it pa- uh uh, positions all these political factions and social factions sorry joe jody you've read the books do you know why because in the trailer uh the yennefer character is like initially like a hunchback is that right and then she's not do you know why that is without ruining it uh no because i skipped one of the books i skipped one of the collections of short stories right. to get ahead because they started out as short stories and then the novels kick in so if you jump okay. ahead to the novels you get to actually you know the bits where Siri and Triss and Deekstra and all your favorite characters from the third game, which is the good one, are running around doing stuff. So I did that. So I've missed all of Yennefer's backstory, which the I think it's told in a flashback. And yeah, uh, which bit me on the ass because I wrote a new story about the Netflix show. Uh, and I mentioned, because it's they've said they're not going to use the games as inspiration. This is just a pure adaptation of the books, not the games. And I was like, oh, so this means we're not going to get, you know, the unicorn scene. And <laughs> a bunch of people were like, well, you didn't read the second book when the unicorn is mentioned. So whoops. Yeah. <laughs> not a true so fan. maybe we'll get to see Action. a uh, sex scene on a unicorn. Uh, I can answer. What was your question? <laughs> I can answer the Yennefer question. Like I put together, I've read some of the short stories and uh, some of the mainline, or I don't know, mainline novels, like the quadrilogy, whatever it is. The saga. Uh, the saga of the Witcher. And I, I, it's common practice among uh, magic users to cast glamours on themselves to make themselves appear more beautiful um, because many of them like are taken into these magic schools because they are disfigured or orphaned or something um and from birth uh, or, or or at a very young age so they come from usually terrible backgrounds and all have like tragic backstories uh and yennefer is no no excuse in that regard um i won't say exactly 
why or how that that comes to be but yeah uh yeah some pretty fascinating stuff some other things to point out from the trailer i think are uh i don't know if you guys remember the dryads from the from from the game or the books in in the game the dryads are like nude voluptuous green women uh, <laughs> who live in the forest and are very much like these nymph-like creatures and in the show this time they're just much they're positioned more as a just a like in some kind of like aboriginal tribe just living out uh in the what's the broccolon broccolon oh they're yeah. like the amazonian kind of ladies in the trailer yeah yeah, yeah. much more uh uh, what, James, what's the deal with the big purple tree? See, that's that's an interesting question, right? Because I saw that and I was like, that scene, that looks like a scene from uh, it's Siri in in a desert with this big like celestial celestial wow I can't say that, celestial tree uh, in the background. Uh, a lot of folks saw that, including myself, and were like, oh, that's from um, Siri's trip to the frying pan and like time of contempt it's like one of the later books and why is that in this trailer uh luckily uh lauren uh history history uh the showrunner was doing a an ama after the trailer was up and folks asked that and she's like no that's something else it's not from that part of the book it's it's earlier on uh so maybe they're taking liberties with series story in that way or at least like alluding to that well without spoiling that stuff uh it's going to be a nightmare for spoilers, isn't it? Because some people have played the game. Some people will have read the books. Some people will be coming in fresh. What and what does not constitute a spoiler is going to be a nightmare. Uh, but yeah, the the desert and the tree. Uh, Siri has like a... I will say Siri is, is, has um, great, 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 great for something grandparents with deeper connections to the mythos of the world. And this might be an expression of that. Um, well, you know that if you played the game. She's special. Uh but yeah, um, a couple other factoids. Uh, do you guys know what that big nasty monster was at the end, coming out of the swamp? Oh, was that like a arachna? Oh, they were in the DLC, weren't they, for The Witcher Three? Yeah, that's. I some... say arachna rock. That's a Warhammer thing. <laughs> arachna rock crossover. Uh, no, that's uh. Well, you know, it could be. It could be one of those. I think they're called the arachnids or something, but spelled with a K or whatever. Um, Folks are thinking this is the Kiki Mora. They're like they live in underground and in, in swamps, which is kind of the the telltale sign. It's also what Geralt brings. This might be like one of the very first scenes in the show. It's what Geralt brings to Blaviken uh, before he gets his nickname, the Butcher of Blaviken, which is an interesting kind of pivotal moment for for Geralt and his reputation. Uh, because if you play the games, he, you might. Well, I'm I'm positive, folks refer to him as the butcher of blaviken and definitely in the books upon first meeting him were, were people mad that he only had one sword in his back in the books that's how it is uh but yes people are very upset there, there's oh my god people are so upset because uh they cast women of color in in roles that are many people imagined or the games imagined as as white and that's been a huge fucking problem for idiots worldwide um it's it's an adaptation take creative liberties like just tell the story and do it i mean it's it's literally got dragons in it yeah <laughs> who fucking cares it's like it's gonna be it's gonna be all right yeah it's, it's gonna, be, gonna fine. be fine especially like everyone's mad about tris uh who uh is is like a pale redhead you know and it's like everyone's little creepy fetish um and she's not a she's not a pale redhead this time she's a, a woman of color with like amber auburn like hair and that's ruined so many people's lives it's it's, it's it's so annoying. It's awful. Uh, some some terrible Witcher fans out there. <laughs> Plenty of good ones. Plenty of good ones. But God, don't go to the subreddit is what I'm saying. Um, other tidbits. One other fact what I want to share is uh, so the big bad and the Emperor of Nilfgaard in throughout most of the Witcher trilogy is Amir von Emer Emrise. I don't know actually how to say his name. Um, but Amir. Uh, he's that the dude with the long black hair and the scowl, the constant scowl on his face, uh, beating the Nymph Guardians. He actually makes a very, very brief appearance in the trailer. And if you don't know, uh, <laughs> well, maybe I'll do, okay. I don't know if this is a spoiler or not. This is, this is the tricky territory, but 
as part of his origin and, and close your ears or shut off for 30 seconds. It's not really that big of a deal. It's just mostly a fun fact. Uh, you'll see in the trailer, maybe I'll pull it up on the screen. There's a like half second shot of this animal looking like half animal, half man guy fighting in a throne room of some kind. Um, and he has kind of like spiky looking hair. And that's because that's basically Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, the Emperor of Nilfgaard was cursed uh, early on to take on the form of a human hedgehog hybrid. Uh, I think you'll find that's Shadow the Hedgehog, James. <laughs> this is the Shadow the Hedgehog origin story. Didn't, did Shadow the Hedgehog have a gun? In one of the games, right? Really? I, like I saw a piece of art when he had a gun. I'm pretty sure. Which one was the werewolf? There's a werewolf Sonic there character? Was, Sonic was a werewolf for a while. Oh my fucking god. So, something I uh, something I saw, James, was that the yeah. showrunner had said that there would not be like a big bad in season one, and that like some characters you kind of initially felt were bad would end up being yeah potentially more kind of nuanced than that. And and Jody, tell me if this is the impression you get from the the books and whatnot. Like in the games, they bring in the Wild Hunt as sort of and the, and and sort of um, the destruction of the world as the big bad, you might say, the Wild Hunt. But in, in the books, it's much more just like all of these political factions and and uh, across varying like uh, uh, across Nilfgaard and other uh, continents and, and, and countries uh, kind of coming to a head and a lot of infighting within those factions and like deceit. It's much more about how bureaucracy and and the human condition fuck up everything from the inside <laughs> and the like, being a good person is very difficult within all of that it's kind of like yeah it's very shades of gray yeah like uh the book that i'm reading at the moment is baptism of fire mm -hmm. which is the one where they're making their way through like this war-torn area where the nilf guardians have burnt down uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of villages and stuff and but really it doesn't make any either side to be out the villains the the actual villain is war it, yes politics is the problem with everything governments are the only villains and war is the only real monster like even when they meet spoilers uh even when they meet a vampire he turns out to like not actually be that bad a guy once you find out his viewpoint and see yeah from, uh yeah. I, I love, yeah, if you play Blood of Wine, Blood of Wine, Blood and Wine, uh, you should definitely read the books because you get a great introduction to some some old friends uh, in the books. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, almost every one of those characters is awful at some point, including Geralt, including Ciri, including, like, they, they are part of, whether they want to be or not, a terrible world and commit, do terrible things to to get by and think on the things they've done and you know it's 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 just a it's pretty it's pretty uh, bleak it's pretty bleak and sort of propped up by that that good sense of humor um like <laughs> is it I, I i'm forgetting which book it is but like half of it is basically uh tris has terrible diarrhea and and Geralt is taking care of her and uh that's half the book they're they're just basically like on on traveling uh while war is happening around them and Geralt's taking care of her friend with uh dysentery basically <laughs> she's puking and, yeah. and shitting herself in the woods it's great and she's really embarrassed because this yeah, is yeah. like after the point where they kind of did it and she has this big crush on him but he's in love with Yennefer and it's this whole thing yeah. but then meanwhile he's dragging her around cleaning up after her yep. and she's just super super embarrassed by it yeah and that is seriously great. half a book yep <laughs> it's great it's great uh yeah i don't know like closing thoughts on what we're thinking about this so far i for me it definitely has the look of a a uh a series where that is stretching its budget it's like a conservative budget siri every time i say siri siri hears me <laughs> um uh i think i called it like sci-fi presents game of thrones there's you can sort of see uh like i mean we, we wrote about the uh, Nilfgaardian armor downgrade, sort of that wrinkly, I don't know, Andy called it ball sack armor, which is just a lovely image. Um, so some concessions made, but I think overall the tone 
presented in the trailer is very much epic and and grandiose and dark and i'm really hoping to see some humor uh, uh come to the fore when it actually comes out and hear Geralt. if like i need to hear henry grunt uh, mm-hmm. uh in in as Geralt would before i can really make a verdict i mean to see the bathtub we need to see all that stuff um but i'm i'm, I'm optimistic i'm hopeful what about you guys yeah, uh, like you, I want to see the humor. But I did hear that uh, a positive sign is that uh, one of the characters from the books, he's called Dandelion in the English translations. Yes. It, we didn't see him in the trailer, or at That's least true. I didn't spot him. And he's he's Geralt's crap friend who is a dandy and a poet. And he's kind of comically useless, but he's the narrator. He's the one who tells the story. Uh and apparently he is going to be in the show, but they're using his name from the original Polish books, which is uh, Jaskier, mm-hmm. because Dandelion is, I guess, too silly a name. But the fact that he's going to be there, I think, is a positive sign, because he is, he is the comic relief character. Definitely. Definitely. Agreed. Tim, closing thoughts on... Uh... I feel like the more we've talked about it, the more you've kind of persuaded me it might be not shit. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like I, I I just see that trailer as signifying nothing really. It's, it's it feels like marketing, just trying to get the Game of Thrones attention or or that kind of crowd. Like, hey, we got that too. And then once we get in, maybe yeah, maybe there's a whole other half uh, or or many many sides to this uh, in tones and to the series that we get to see. So. Like almost everything is going to hinge on like how watchable Cavill is as the character. Like. Yeah. No, no amount of just liking the world will make up for the fact that if he's a charisma black hole, it just ain't going to happen. Like True. he has to be, he has to be watchable, and that's quite a big if. So we'll see. We'll see. But I want it to be good. I mean, I want everything to be. I'm with you. Expect like it just, it just usually isn't. We're gonna, we're gonna go straight up uh, entertainment website and cover the hell out of that show because how could we not? So expect plenty of. Um, witcher coverage when, when that when that drops and as news comes out we do have an everything we know i'll link to in chat where you can find out who's playing who you can see the trailer all that good stuff uh if you're behind but uh let, let's move on to uh the meat of the show and uh let's talk about uh let's talk about some trading cards wait you can't trade them never mind they're just cards you collect collectible, collectible cards. cards collectible cards digital collectible cards what's up with hearthstone tim uh, so we, we're we're in like I guess the calm before hopefully the storm. The game's in a one of its periodic lulls between sets. Although they've been doing a better job actually recently of trying to fill those gaps. They've had like a they had a kind of event where they buffed a bunch of cards, which was unheard of. They'd never buffed cards since the beta, mm-hmm. um, and they bu- they buffed a bunch of cards from a previous set that were all kind of mech themed, which was kind of key and, and went down pretty well. So right now we're in the we're in the, the spoiler phase for the next set, which is Saviors of All Doom. Did I pronounce that right, Jody? All Doom. I think it's a wow area. Maybe I don't know. It's like Blue. a desert. It's like a desert area. So they're doing they're doing like three sets this year as normal, but they've they've kind mm-hmm. of got this narrative running through all three sets. So where where we we join the story, James, is that the evil classes, led by uh, the uh, arch villain Rafam and Doctor Boom and uh, Madame Lazul, have like stolen a whole city, which is the city of Dalaran, uh, a magical city of wizards jody's gonna have to jump in if i say anything particularly heinous regarding the law and they've they've flown this city but it's crashed i think into the area on a crash into blackwater mountain anyway they're they're chilling in all doom basically okay and the good guys as represented by the league of explorers are back to kind of battle the bad guys all that stuff is kind of to me like i guess it's nice fluff but i don't really care like what i care about is like the new cards and the thing they're doing with this set is they're bringing back these four characters, which was they, they were interesting characters because it was Hearthstone's first real attempt to break with WoW lore and generate their own heroes. So they had hmm. these four these four characters who are called the League of Explorers, who are uh, Sir Finley uh, Mergleton, who's, as the name suggests, like this posh Murloc. <laughs> uh, Reno Jackson, who's this kind of bluff explorer, and Bran Bronzebeard, who is this kind of... Uh, kind of comic relief dwarf guy and then elise starseeker who is um i don't even know what she was but she's she's now going to be the druid uh hero she's like she had point years so i assume is some sort of jody save me i don't know what she is <laughs> i don't uh, actually know either she's a purple lady 
Purple lady. I, I want to say elf. like night like elf, elf, but I, I figure it might be wrong. Um, the the these characters come back. They were kind of beloved because they were part of an adventure set, and they were all first time around very playable legendary cards with which each had a powerful effect. This time they're coming back, and they're all built around the singleton theme. Singleton or Highlander means you can only include one copy of every card in your deck. Mm-hmm. Um, so that inherently makes your deck um much less stable and inconsistent because you can't include two copies of all the best stuff um and the payoff for doing that is is meant to be pretty big and we revealed on pc gamer one of those cards uh which was a card called dino tamer bran which is the new version of bran bronzebeard he's a, a hunter character sorry a hunter legendary card and his payoff is that he summons the dinosaur king crush which is like an eight mana which is normally a nine mana eight, eight that you can charge straight uh, at your opponent. Mm. Um, So I was like super excited by that. When we did, when we did the interview um, with a couple of the blizzard devs, um, Liv Breeden and Dave Kosak, they'd actually sent me the wrong art for the card um, (laughs) by accident. So I I began the interview and originally, and it was an interesting chat because we talked about how these cards get iterated on. And what I'd received was an earlier version where the card summoned like two smaller dinosaurs that couldn't attack your opponent right in the face, which is a, still a powerful effect. But King Crush is like one of the like OG cards. He's this when you summon him, it's like this Jurassic Park, and he gets dropped onto the board. And the, the problem was he was always like a bad card as well. He was like really mm. overcosted, so you never really saw him that much beyond people kind of trying to meme with him. Mm. So I love the fact that they found a way to kind of get Crush back in the game, whether or not the restriction of having to have no duplicates in your deck is is too punishing is kind of debatable i think hunter probably can make a deck with singleton um copies of cards single copies of cards but a lot of people have been more skeptical and kind of pointed out that hunter is a class that really relies on being aggressive and trying to win the game early and doesn't want to have this kind of drawn out strategy where you you know you oftentimes what if you when you've got a legendary like Dino Timber Brand, there'll be plenty of games where you don't draw it at all um, mm. because you'll only see half of your deck during a game. Um, elsewhere in the set, they've there's a couple of new keywords. One is Reborn. Um, reborn cards are ones which, when they die, uh, they summon a copy of the same card, but it only has one health. So it kind of makes cards like stickier and hard, harder to remove. Um, that kind of, it's a bit like a death rattle effect has, has traditionally been quite powerful. Um, I've, I've felt like looking at the people have been saying like there's a lot of power creep in this set and there's a mm. lot of kind of, you know, big splashy effects. I'm not so sure. To me, it feels a little bit like thematically this set is a bit all over the place. They're also bringing back like the quest mechanic. Um, mm. Quests were cards that. where, yeah, they start in your hand, they cost one mana, so you can always play them on turn one. Um, and then you, they each set you a target. Like the new Warlock one is you have to draw, I think, 20 cards, which is a lot. There's ways to kind of cheat it, but it's a lot. The Shaman one is, I think, play X number of Battle Cries. And then previously, the payoff would then be put into your hand as another card you had to cast, which made them quite clunky to pull off and mm. expensive to pull off. And only a few really were successful. Like, the rogue one was so successful that it had to be nerfed a couple of times and i think the, the mage one saw a bit of play but beyond that the quests were very very hit and miss um and what they've done this time mm-hmm. is made it so the quests are a little bit easier to um perform and the payoff happens automatically in in each case you get a better hero power like i think the shaman one is you can summon like a 2-2 copy of any minion you've got on the board so they're not quite as game breaking, and it's, it was interesting listening to like Dean Ayala, who's one of the developers, talking about how they didn't want it to be so polarizing, so that you either got your quest off and just won a couple of turns later, or you didn't get your quest off and got kind of completely steamrolled. So they, they tried to make it more like it's something that will just happen naturally in the mid game and will will have a big effect, but won't necessarily uh, swing it. So, though I think those things are interesting, they both seem to me like th- they're effects and ideas that people have played with before in in this reno style one-off singleton deck and the quests and i worry that people may get be less excited by kind of revisiting them once the initial mm. hype dies down um <clears throat> another thing that i think is kind of tricky is that blizzard's design team will be working on like three sets at a time so they're thinking about like not even necessarily 
what this meta game looks like, but kind of what the meta game is going to look like two sets from now. And and right at the moment, um, the game is really dominated. I think in terms of power level by like kind of warrior um, and mage, and to a lesser degree, rogue and hunter. And and that's four classes, so maybe that's fine. But I was hoping to see more stuff that that took warrior down a peg or two and we don't seem to have seen a lot of that in fact warrior's getting some pretty some pretty interesting new cards with taunts energy kind of coming in that may just slot into some of the existing powerful warrior decks um so i'm hoping for at the same time the set comes out they do like a big balance patch they have been definitely better at reacting um to balance issues i think than they have been in previous years um the biggest the biggest kind of challenge facing the game at the moment really is the fact that a lot of the kind of popular um content channels and producers have really been kind of all in on uh um the the Team auto games. And, yeah, yeah i was gonna ask TFT. that because i was gonna ask about the health of the the community overall or or because that everyone is like eat some big youtube or excuse me twitch streamers have just like fully committed to these auto battlers what's going on yeah i mean like i i've seen in the hearthstone directory on twitch like it's been down to like some nights like six thousand, you know, concurrent viewers, which is tiny compared yeah. to what it used to be. It used to be up to kind of a hundred thousand would be a kind of fairly standard, like healthy period. So that's probably worrying. Like Blizzard Blizzard don't release um Blizzard don't release their numbers publicly, obviously, um, beyond you kind of see what's happening in earning re- earnings reports and stuff. And it's been pointed out that like this this is kind of common in summer lulls with expansions coming up. You do see that kind of big drop off. But um, yeah, if the team, if the auto battlers don't go away and there's no reason to think they would, then they definitely are kind of like, you know, targeting the same crowd, people who like turn-based kind of strategic, Mm -hmm. colorful, you know, games that you can kind of really go deep on. I mean, you can arguably go deep on the strategy side of things with those games. Um, And and, and it's for sure lured lured away a bunch of people who were considered like the stars of the Hearthstone scene. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an element where for too long Hearthstone didn't have new features and still arguably doesn't in terms of stuff like a tournament mode, in terms of more and more kind of ways to play the game. Um, And until it really grapples with how it's going to do that at the same time as delivering these kind of three sets a year, I think it will probably still hurt a little bit from that. So what you're saying, Tim, is is, uh, dead game. (laughs) <laughs> it's a dead game. I I only play dead games, so, as you know. Uh, no, that's it's fascinating. I, it, so it sounds like this expansion just kind of like isn't making the big fundamental changes that's gonna suddenly get uh, Hearthstone, uh, up, you know, on, uh, everyone uh, playing it again. It's just kind of moving stuff around. And, and L- like, don't get me wrong. There's some fun stuff in there. Like we've seen right. a couple of like really meme cards announced there's one which is like a kind of one one guy where if you can get like seven copies of of, of that dude mm-hmm. on the uh board at the same time then you'll summon they'll kind of all be sacrificed they're cultist guys they'll all be sacrificed it will summon like a 2020 dude that dude will then do 20 damage immediately to every enemy on the board plus the opponent like now that's not um really going to be like a viable strategy i think like rogue maybe to do it by shuffling a bunch of the same card in like using togwag or scheme or something but um it's the kind of thing where like streamers will have fun like goofing around trying to get mm-hmm. the effect off and, and there'll be some like funny times when it makes kind of highlight videos and clip reels uh there's another one where there's like this zero five like desert statue and if you can get three of them into play at once then they'll each do five damage to three random enemies or something like that which again is like a goofy combo that you can mess around trying to get off i think my kind of issue with it is though the though the league of explorers they don't feel to me as exciting as when like hearthstone did the old gods and they had like Cthune and Mm -hmm. zoth and yog saron and like i love it when they have that kind of like even though I don't play well, when they do something like that, or when they do the Death Knights like they did with the Lich King, it feels like those big wow beats are kind of what gets people really into it. So I'd, I'd have been more up for that, seeing them do like, you know, Burning Legion or something like that and having like crazy demon infested expansion, which, you know, I'm sure they'll get to at some point. Yeah. Um, this feels a little bit like one of those expansions kind of between expansions. Mm. Does that kind of make sense? Stop, it feels yeah. a yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't want to say like filler necessarily because I think there is some fun stuff yeah. going on, and I really I think those one the, the one off deck building thing is cool, but I worry about like it's the kind of thing where if it whiffs, it may whiff hard. Hmm. 
Interesting. It's interesting time for uh, Hearthstone and it, Blizzard it overall. Times? I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, Blizzard, I'm, Blizzard had the guy quit recently as well, or, or not quit, retire. Was it, uh, I forget his name now, Pierce, was it? I need to Frank Pierce. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, another one of the kind of real OG, like, senior, Blizzard senior management. People have mm-hmm. kind of been talking about how it reflects, <clears throat> you know, potentially the increasing, I want to say subsumation, but I don't know if that's an actual word. Vision. Exactly. I get it. I get it. If it's not, it should be, right? Yeah, you do. It's in the dictionary now. Um, yeah. yeah. How much How much of uh, Activision is just Blizzard now and how much of Blizzard is Activision? Like, the identity, that line there is getting I mean, Blizzard blurry. still makes a big, a big old bunch of money for them, oh, so. Yeah. I'm, they're I, they're not going out of business or anything. Yeah. Or, you know, they're not going to be rebranded. <laughs> should we have talked about the new Overwatch hero, by the way? I don't know anything about it. I don't either. That's, the, that's why it's, it's a controversy a... about his shoes. That's all I know. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't have shoes. That's all he I know. <laughs> He's a scientist yeah. without shoes. That's yeah. that's about it. Yeah, yeah. That's I don't know. You know, he's on well, James. He's got no shoes. Uh, Blizzard is not. I don't know. At least in in the public sphere, I think uh, they are experiencing a lull. There's no. You know, we've had Overwatch for a while. We've had Hearthstone for a while. When those games were new, uh, and before all of these big names had left, and before um, this this uh, you know Blizzard and Activision let so many people go. Optimism was high. Everyone was kind of sort of riding on these new trends and, and new uh, these new games. And now we're sort of like what three or four years, almost five years into those, and we've yet to see a new a big new Blizzard property. Their WoW expansion is like people don't like it too much. Uh, we just really need, I think, the next tentpole to to come out that Diablo Four. Like it's it's got to happen, or something's got to happen soon. Um, not that they're they're not in danger, but. but- but imagine the hype if they did announce Diablo 4, like, say at BlizzCon this year. Yeah. I think people would still go nuts. Oh, absolutely. I'd go nuts. I'd, I, mm-hmm. And I, I have a terrible uh, toxic relationship with Diablo. <laughs> so uh, I'd still be excited about it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Interesting, interesting times. Uh, but thanks thanks for the card update, Tim. Any closing thoughts, closing words on, on, on this uh, expansion? Uh, it's out August 6th. I think... Um... If, if I seemed a little down on it, there's still a, a whole bunch of cards still to be revealed. So yeah. plenty plenty of uh, scope for like your favorite class to see some more exciting stuff. I think um, I'll probably be playing Hunter on day one, partly because we, we revealed that card, but it's also had some, some other really cool cards revealed for it. So Hunter and Shaman are kind of the things I'm looking at to uh, dip into straight away. Right on. Jody, do you play card games? I do, but I defected from Hearthstone uh, a couple of years ago. I stopped playing it and I started playing the Elder Scrolls Legends. Oh, you're still on that? I was. They did their Isle of Madness expansion earlier this year, which was really fun. It's kind of like there's still a a decent following. It's a much, much smaller following, but they're they're still Uh, a much smaller following. I did back into that this week, actually. Yeah? Yeah, Yeah, because they got. I haven't played the new cards, but the Isle of Madness cards were good. There's the new expansion, I forget the name of. It came oh out yeah, it's quite, the Khajiit uh, one. It's is it just called Elsewhere? Yeah, yep. uh, I think it's called Moons of Elsewhere. Yes, uh, I didn't like at all. They have this like wax wane mechanic where cards basically change while they're in your hand, which which Hearthstone has done before, and I've always hated as a mechanic. Hmm. But um, I, I I net decked a bunch of uh, decks and tried it tried it out, and it seemed like it was still fun. Cool. Then I lo- then I lost a game and got really furious and. <laughs> gonna happen right on that game's still ticking along happy to hear it um well let's, let's move on to the finals uh part of the show and answer some questions from twitch chat and the pc gamer club discord if you don't know what i'm talking about when i say the pc gamer club discord go to club.pcgamer.com to find out more it's just a private private discord where uh club mem- members hang out um and can ask questions directly uh you also get some cool benefits for the site it's club.pcgamer.com uh, let's answer some of these Discord questions first. Uh, we've got a couple from uh, from uh, past shows we didn't have time to get to, so we'll start there. This one comes from Mox, and Mox asks, what's one tweak you'd make to your favorite game? While you think about that, let me remind Twitch chat, if you have questions in Twitch chat, feel free to ask too. Just tag PC Gamer, otherwise I'm probably going to miss it. Um, yeah, so Mox What's one tweak you'd make to your favorite game? And Tim, I feel like you have plenty of answers for this and plenty of tweaks because 
you play like two games and i'd i'd probably add some sort of crafting to destiny i was one of the people who loved the you could reforge weapons in mm -hmm. the first game and people i wouldn't say got abused but it, it made it maybe too easy to get like god roll uh perk perk layouts but i would love it if you could on a piece of gear where uh it's almost perfect you could re-roll just one of the talents like mm -hmm. maybe each time you re-rolled it it costs more materials and stuff but just bit, like i said going back to my kind of inventory ocd having something that's almost perfect but not being able to like uh change one thing on it i, I would love that nice i love cra i love crafting in general do you You'll love yeah, I mean, not Fantasy like, 14. Not like, not like baskets and stuff, but oh, okay, I like crafting mind. guns, basically, but that makes me sound like a psycho. <laughs> There's a thin line between uh, that and the truth. But uh, Jody, any... I, I mean, I, I get hung up on favorite game because I don't know if I have one. Yeah. But uh, is there anything that comes to mind uh, you change about one of your favorite games? Uh, my favorite game ever is the original Fallout, which I would change so that the dog cannot die. <laughs> Dog meat, invincible, unkillable, and uh, then it would be perfect. How how often and how soon, when you play through, does dog meat die for you? Dog meat doesn't die early on. early on. Dog meat is boss, but as you level up, you get power armor. Everybody gets big guns, and you cannot put power armor on your dog. Maybe that's the real problem. You oh. need dog sized power armor. So by the time you're fighting super mutants with chain guns and lasers. You have to reload a lot to get dog meat through to the end of the game, which can't I have you, done. Can't you but... mod the dog to be invincible? Can you? God, I don't know. I'm not I, saying. I've never like... actually modded the original Fallout, so there's got to be a way. Uh, must be. Bethesda, if you're listening, now that you uh, are making those games, uh, you did it with horse armor. Get, get, get dog meat hooked up. Get dog meat hooked up, please. Stat. Um, for me, gosh, again, so many favorite games. Uh, but recently, like, I've been playing Forza Horizon uh, 4, uh, which is just a very fun, chill summer game. Uh, and I think I play that game so much, not just because it's, like, a, a great car fantasy, but because it reminds me of Burnout Paradise. And I would love, maybe if not, I don't know, maybe not, like, layered on top of the whole thing, but I would love events that are destruction-based or at least, like, some kind of... It's maybe too on the nose, but I, I think I'm, I like the, how it teaches you technical driving, but I wish there were, there were modes or some way to reward sloppy, very aggressive uh, driving. Especially, I would love to see those cars get wrecked, just, just, just totally screwed up. Um, so maybe not a small tweak, but uh, a, a mode that requires quite a bit of work <laughs> to <laughs> attach to a, a series that is kind of fundamentally not about destroying cars. Uh, oh, but, but those burnout crash modes are wonderful. Yeah. yeah um, I just remember being, well, especially in Paradise, just not even doing events, just driving around the world and uh, destroying, destroying so many, so many cars just because it felt nice. It felt nice to make those corners and it felt nice to like get the right angle and momentum when you sideswipe them and, and that feeling when the camera pulls out and like shows them uh, spinning off uh, the edge of the road and tumbling down a hillside. Great feeling. And I, I think uh, I think there's still room for that kind of stuff uh, in, in our big open world driving games. So please, someone. Uh, thanks, Mox, for that question. <laughs> a quick one here from uh, Future Joe. Uh, I think that's our community moderator, who asks, as someone who has attempted Final Fantasy XIV no fewer than seven times, Good God. How do I get past the pray the return to the waking sands uh, quote, uh, pray the return to the waking sands without wanting to jump Chocobo first off a cliff into the abyss. And if, if you don't know what he's talking about and chances are you don't know what he's talking about, there's a, you're part of this group uh, that is located in this, in this town um, and in this building uh, behind two loading screens. Uh, and to get to that town, you need to teleport to a town that is like, I don't know, a one minute chocobo ride away. So, and you're, you have to go there all the time to pick up quests and turn in quests. So it's a nightmare because you teleport to this town, ride the chocobo for a minute, sprint to the building, sprint downstairs, uh, go through one loading screen, run across a hallway, and then go through another loading screen to get to someone who, your, your quest giver. Uh, and, and it's you go there all the time, and it sucks so much. It sounds like Anthem, basically. 
Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a decent comparison. It's, it's like a nightmare that I, and it doesn't make any sense why it's designed that way. Um, even, even though it came out in like 2013, uh, or wait. Yeah. I don't know. Time is weird. Uh, I have no answer for you. This is why I'll never recommend Final Fantasy XIV to anyone because if you play from the beginning, because you have to put up with a lot of bullshit. Um, I am just banking on Steven's words and Bo's words and all of the people in this Final Fantasy Discord they invited me into that it gets better. Um, and it has. Like The storytelling really takes, uh, takes you by the hand and kind of pulls you through that. Um, even when it's really... Most of the quests where I'm at are just running to places or teleporting to places and talking to people. Combat's not really part of it. Um, it's just a story happening, and you are sort of this vessel. Uh, your character is like this empty vessel that experiences it um, as it happens around you. So eventually I can say that you don't have to go there. You, you, move, you pick up and move away to a place with a, an instant teleport to your, your main quest giver. So it just takes like 60 hours. <laughs> so... Do it for 60 hours. That's my answer. Uh, thanks for that question, Joe. We got one more in the chat here. Uh, uh, uh. Splat a cake asks best gaming headset 2019 with replaceable ear pads. I don't know if you guys offhand know uh, a headset or can recommend one, but if not, I'll just direct you to our buying guide. Uh, PC gamer headset. Best. I I bought a headset from the buying guide not so long ago. Let me just check what it was. I don't know if I don't know if the cups are replaceable. I think they probably are. Let's try and find it. Uh, I'm a fan of this. Gosh, what is it? Oh, I bought a Steel Series Arctis Seven lossless wireless gaming headset, which was uh that was about 150 dollars here in the US. It's really good though. I love it. I replaced I think uh, a Logitech one which I had before and there's the sound is genuinely much, much better, much kind of clearer. You can hear like a lot of separation between like effects and music that I couldn't before it deals with chat nicely as well. I would recommend it strongly. Arctis seven steel Arctis series seven. Yeah. I think I had one of those somewhere and I like it a lot. It's and again, it's going to depend on your head size, like honestly and, and, and hair and, and uh, ears and so many things like it's hard to recommend a headset to someone we, we don't know. But um, peruse that uh, best of uh, our, our, our best gaming headset list and sort of do some reading, do some research and um, hit up maybe Bo or other folks uh, if you have m more questions um, or whoever wrote that. They can probably point you to someone who can help you out. Yeah. Uh, Jody, do you have any headsets? Are you a headset aficionado or are you just like whatever you got? Uh, I have a, a cheap Sony one, but I have a really big head. So wearing headsets for any length of time gives me a real real headache so Same. I, I don't use it very often Same. Yeah. the curse of the big-headed man i know hard to find hats hard to find headsets just slight ear you know uh tension on the head it, it's it's you it's, both it's look like hell. you've got regular size heads to me you need something like for comparison's sake you need oh yeah, yeah normal like human being. Tiny, big. tiny coffee mug <laughs> next to your enormous <laughs> easter island head <laughs> um we got oh one more in da, 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 da. Okay, one more in chat. Joe Stoic, what PSU does James use for that shirt power supply? It's uh, I got this at uh, I don't know. I think it was on Mission Street in in San Francisco. <laughs> There's some secondhand store like Mission Th Thrift or something for like two bucks. It's uh, it's that time of the year where I'm wearing uh, sandals, uh, shorts that are too short for someone like me, and uh, button ups uh, with floral button ups um, and enjoying the heat. It's very hot here in Eugene, but uh, yeah. So, well, do you have a do you have a set of gaming pants, James? Gamer a gamer pants. Pair of uh, gamer pants. <laughs> the best gamer pants I can recommend are no pants, baby. Whoa. Oh. Um, Not like this. <laughs> didn't we see in chat someone was sharing? Uh, there's uh, esports shoes now, like official esports. Friend, friend of mine was genuinely using uh, <laughs> like that gamer uh, grip stuff that makes your hand like not sweaty gamer i guess goo, yeah. oh, gamer goo. i don't think it was the goo he said it was like a grip thing and okay. it was when we were doing like i'm going to just close out the podcast with another destiny anecdote james how do you feel about <laughs> that's that that's great fine sure we so we, we we had to do like a flawless raid to get this kind of in-game title um 
which is obviously as the name suggests means no one can die and a bunch mm -hmm. of times people did die because there's like a jumping section in the middle where i was just getting more and more nervous i legitimately took a valium i stole one of my girlfriend's valiums and took it don't do drugs kids um but they got to the point where they would be watching me jump and they would tell me to out F4 if they thought I was going to fall. Oh because if you, if you hard quit out the game, um, it doesn't kill the run. You can just spawn back in at the next bit. Um, but yeah, one of the guys I was playing with was using... He, he put us all on mute, by the way, because he was so stressed out by the amount we were kind of like clucking and panicking as we were doing this jumping bit. There was like yeah. moving pistons and shit. So he, he put us all on mute, but he was the one who said um, he uses this like grip stuff for her. So his hand doesn't slip off the mouse, I guess. All right. Just sand? Just. I don't know. Dirt. Yeah, I, I want to think of like a bodybuilder, like, uh, yeah, putting the yeah, chalk yeah. on. Like a talcum. That's but my, I mean, my hand was sweating, though. No joke. Like, it was stressful because, like, the, the problem was the bit that precedes that jumping bit is this really not very hard, but very grindy, like, wave battle bit where you have to basically, like, it takes maybe 10, 15 minutes to do. Uh, not that long but it's, it's long it feels long when you're doing it for like the 10th time for sure so no one wants to be the person who forces us to do the wave bit again mm. which i which i was <laughs> it's usually me a lot of peer pressure in those moments here's the thing like if you want to here's a life hack uh most of like the gamer goo and all these products are like like you said joe mentioned uh it's like talcum powder or chalk powder <laughs> with like water <laughs> or some kind of like <laughs> Uh, component that dries up quickly. You can just go outside <laughs> and just like rub your hands in the dirt. Guess what? You got you, you don't want you don't want you don't want your other half to come in, find you at the PC, and you've rubbed a paste over your hands. That's a bad look. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you have to explain game of goo on your desk. Oh boy, yeah. but uh, that we're, we're out of time for today. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, you can catch us here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time on twitch.tv slash PC Gamer. You can catch us uh, after the fact at youtube.com slash PC Gamer for the video on demand, or you can go to pcgamer.com slash tag slash podcast, where you can find links to our iTunes feed, Spotify, anchor.fm, uh, the RSS feed, if you want to just plug it into any podcast app of your choosing, MP3, whatever you like, we got it. Um, and if you're on iTunes, uh, make sure you look for The PC Gamer Show, uh, not the PC Gamer Podcast. Don't get it mixed up. And if you're there and you like us, why don't you, you know, leave, us a little, leave us a little rating and review if, if, if you got the time so we can jump back up to prominence where we once stood. Um, yeah, and so until until next week, uh, never forget. And Jody, I guess we've never had you on for the, the sign-off, but what I do is I, I inspire the gamers out there and ask them to never forget to game on. So... If you don't mind, I'm going to say, don't forget to, and I would like you to say, game on, and that's how we'll end the show. Does that, does that sound okay? That sounds good, James. That's, that's a nice battle cry. All don't right. be bullied by him, Jody. If you don't want to do it, <laughs> do, it Jody. do it, Jody. Do it. Until next week, don't forget to game on. Beautiful. Thanks, Jody. See ya. Oh, my God. Bye.